I give the floor to my colleague, uh, I said to I said to the floor is yours. Thank you, Zainab. I will um, I will make a short presentation on the OER recommendation, and then I will pass the floor to our distinguished speakers who will give more details on the topic. So um, I will I will make my presentation in French. Um, donc, um, la présentation va pour... Now uh, I'm going to uh, give you an overview of the uh, UNESCO OER recommendation and especially highlighting um, action area three, which is uh, on quality, inclusive and accessible OER. Next slide, please. Now, before I delve into the matter proper, let's take a broader look at UNESCO recommendations. Now, what does the what is a UNESCO recommendation? Well, it is a standard setting instrument, much like conventions and decisions. A recommendation is a normative instrument. And so the organization sets standards and guiding principles for member states in very specific fields. UNESCO, uh, as an organization, also requests uh, member states to produce reports on their implementation of the various measures uh, set out in the recommendation. Recommendations, and in particular this one, um, do provide a certain degree of flexibility and um, can be easily adapted to constant technological progress. Now, this recommendation on OER was adopted by member states during the 40th session of the UNESCO General Conference. And um, it is made up of a certain number of measures. And this recommendation um, underlines the fact that learning, teaching and research resources need to be in the public domain or need uh, to be um, openly licensed. It also um, uh, issues guidelines on uh, the fact that these resources need to be easily accessible, uh, adaptable, uh, need to be uh, able to be repurposed and reused. Open licensing uh, reflects uh, uh, um, intellectual property rights. The recommendation also uh, sets out a list of different uh, stakeholders. There's a very long list of stakeholders, uh, teachers, educators, and so on. And so I would encourage you to take a look at the recommendation to see the list of stakeholders involved. The recommendation also includes five objectives, which are also the action areas. And so uh, it is in these action areas that member states need to undertake various steps. So the first action area is building the capacity of stakeholders to create, access, reuse, adapt, and redistribute OER. The second action area is developing supportive policy. The third is encouraging inclusive and equitable quality OER. And also um, developing sustainability models for OER, that's the fourth. And then the fifth action area is promoting and reinforcing international cooperation in OER. And this webinar series is a part of uh, international cooperation as it falls under the work of the Dy Dynamic Coalition. The Dynamic Coalition was created to facilitate synergies among different stakeholders working on the recommendation. 
Now let's focus on action area number three. Next slide. Now, action area three includes a certain number of measures that member states are encouraged to take. And so I'd like to focus on a few of these. It asks member states uh, to take into consideration the material circumstances of learners and pedagogical objectives. They also ask stakeholders to um, adopt rules that are gender sensitive, that are uh, culturally sensitive and relevant to the local context. And so multilingualism um, in particular is applicable here, um, including indigenous languages. Now this action area also asks that uh, gender equality and non-discrimination uh, accessibility principles as well as inclusion be respected as well in developing these rules. Now under this action area, number three, it is also uh, important that low-income communities as well as rural and urban communities be included um, in these methods. Now, as you have seen, Action Area 3 really aims to be as inclusive as possible and to leave no one behind. So you've seen that uh, this entails involving learners of all ages, particularly people with disabilities, uh, people who are economically and socially underprivileged, the vulnerable uh, indigenous peoples, people living in remote rural areas, including uh, nomadic populations, uh, people who are affected by uh, disasters, ethnic mi minorities, migrants, refugees, and displaced persons. The principles of equity and inclusion, particularly for underprivileged learners um, who have su suffered from various forms of discrimination, um, are absolutely crucial. Now, as you have seen, this action area contains um, various aspects and specific measures that member states and stakeholders are encouraged to take. UNESCO supports member states in implementing these various measures in different ways. And so in uh, sessions to come, we are going uh, to go over the various terms that I've mentioned. And our speakers will um, discuss some of these issues, particularly multilingualism and indigenous languages, as well as issues of accessibility for persons with disabilities in the context of ODL. And we will also talk about accessibility in higher education and finally, we will also uh, discuss uh, connectivity and gender issues in Francophone Africa. And so without much further ado, I'm going to give the floor to our first speaker, uh, Dr. Imgarda Kassin Kaite. Uh, thank you, uh, colleagues, for this invitation. Um, it's really a great pleasure to be with you here and of course to address you on the occasion of International Day of Education and, uh, and this meeting is dedicated to open educational resources which is very important task for all of us uh, to make sure that uh, resources are available in uh, different formats in different languages respecting uh, a number of important principles and um, I'm as well responsible for another normative instrument which is clearly linked as well to open educational resources even if it is a little bit old and it is called the recommendation concerning the promotion and use of multilingualism and universal access to cyberspace. Uh, this recommendation, the same as 
what recommendation was adopted by uh, UNESCO's uh, General Conference in 2003, and we've been uh, uh, promoting for some time. And I remember when uh, the process of the preparation of 2019 recommendation, what we are talking, we made a sure that the issues related to accessibility and multilingualism are well um, integrated in its early beginning. Uh, but today, it's as well an important historical event uh, because this is the first official UNESCO event where we are marking the opening of International Decade of Indigenous Languages. And already my colleagues mentioned what um, uh, 2022 is the first year of International Decade. And it was proclaimed by uh, United Nations General Assembly in 2019 as one of the important outcomes and conclusions of International of Indigenous Languages. And um, I invite you to all to look at the documents which will be shared and as well to take a very active role in the future activities of international decade. And um, what is really interesting with uh, international year in 2019 uh, concluded with very uh, clear recommendations with the intergenerational transmission of languages uh, would take place as well in formal, non-formal uh, educational settings, supporting the development of educational um, platforms, providing new opportunities for students and teachers, and those who are related to the educational processes, but we would make sure what education is to multilingualism. And the uh, lessons learned um, compiled and uh, already published in the flagship report, but, uh, which is available on UNESCO website. This is an interesting document because it it's provides a good summary and analysis of uh, more than 900 events, which took place only in one year related to the international um, year and, uh, and uh, issues related to languages. Um, knowing what uh, the recommendation on OER was adopted by General Conference 2019, and already as mentioned, with, um, it includes a clear reference, an invitation to all stakeholders to respect and recognize the importance of linguistic diversity and multilingualism. And in order to provide full, inclusive, and equitable education, the training and learning materials, obviously, we have to be available in languages where teachers and students understand best. And that's of course includes the materials like uh, corporas, glossaries, dictionaries, descriptions about languages, any related data, which would be as well made available in multiple languages. Sometimes we can see it with a number of resources, which could be used not only for language learning, but as well uh, for learning any other subject are not provided in uh, lesser used languages, minority languages and indigenous languages. And uh, if we are made, uh, maybe we are strictly copyrighted and um, a different stakeholders have basically to invent uh, more or less the same things which could be already used from other sources. Um, just very quickly, um, what international decade provides for all of us and what this uh, group of the coalition on OER could actually take a benefit and be an actively involved in our processes. UNESCO is first of all a lead UN agency for organization of international year. This is why in future we will be very closely collaborating with my colleagues Zainab and other ones who work on uh, OER issues. And even in context of international decade, UNESCO facilitated the establishment of um, global task force for making a decade of action, which is um, an important international cooperation um, mechanism uh, governing structure, which is composed of uh, different stakeholders from member states, indigenous community representatives and organizations, our UN colleagues and many other partners were interested in promotion, uh, revitalization and uh, protection of indigenous languages. For the preparation of the action plan, which is available now on UNESCO website, um, the UNESCO took a number of series of measures how to prepare it. And uh, that was a kind of lengthy and long, uh, lengthy, uh, long process. But at the same time, we wanted to make sure that this is fully inclusive and all stakeholders have a voice and the considerations and taken on board. And just very briefly to mention what um, the process started in uh, 2020 in July. 
by establishing uh, ad hoc group of appreciation of action plan. And when many educators, um, our colleagues from a research community were involved in this process, um, we followed up with um, online survey, which basically generated uh, contributions from 99 uh, countries. We had as well seven indigenous cultural um, in all indigenous uh, social cultural regions consultations. That means seven uh, different regions were consulted. And um, during all those processes, we tried to establish the hierarchy of teams or priorities which have to be addressed for safeguarding uh, indigenous languages. And I can tell you what education, access to education, access to quality materials in indigenous languages was everywhere highlighted as a top priority. It was actually the top thematic priority which we identified across the world. And this is why it is important that in our future actions, we would work together and we make sure that this priority is fully reflected in our work. So uh, this is an important discovery. Sometimes it is maybe seen as self-evident, but it's always uh, to have, um, it's always good to have um, confirmation from such a group, uh, such a big group of stakeholders from 99 countries, uh, which confirmed that uh, this is one of the priorities. For these reasons, of course, the action plan um, includes a number of important aspects, and maybe I just could focus very briefly on a few things. What uh, the future actions will be planned around four outcomes. One of them is related to intergenerational transmission of languages and making sure that intergenerational transmission of language takes into account as well inclusive participatory and uh, respectful uh, indigenous cultures uh, learning and training processes as uh, so it's one of the important outcomes and we as well identified 10 outputs and one of them is linked it's actually number one linked to uh, inclusive, equitable, intercultural quality education and lifelong learning environments and opportunities in indigenous languages which are provided in informal, non-formal and informal educational settings. And uh, what is interesting, what we as well invited different stakeholders to identify for each of them what would be the broad activities. And um, uh, the one that I just uh, read for you, uh, which concerns uh, education or access to education and um, access to educational uh, resources, um, include uh, three major broad activities. And uh, the first one is definitely related to development of um, language friendly educational policies, plans, and programs, alongside with legislation, with the alignment to the uh, implementing sustainable development uh, mechanism, especially uh, SDG4, uh, to support a mother-based, um, uh, mother tongue-based uh, and multilingual education. And here it is, of course, the references made to uh, first nine years of basic education and going beyond, including as well aspects related to the fostering of um, multicultural, multilingual, uh, curriculum development, which would take into consideration, of course, gender equality, human rights, inclusive, as well as uh, linguistically diverse aspects. The activity number two, which is a broad one, it is suggested as well to address um, in our work, includes the involvement and improvement of indigenous multilingual education um, professionals. Uh, which would be teachers uh, and development of a professional standards and skills uh, is as well and involves to be language specialists like interpreters and translators uh, through initial and in-service training programs at all educational uh, uh, levels. And here we clearly have a reference to open educational resources, inviting to take into account the importance of OER. And a third activity, a broad activity, which was identified by this big group of stakeholders, it relates to development of community-based uh, programs, systems, institutions, including adults' education in a manner which is appropriate to uh, indigenous people's cultural practices, traditions, uh, deploying as well distinct um, training methods, uh, traditional knowledge, with special focus on indigenous girls and women, 
uh, and what is interesting as well, but the action plan and the processes we went through from the identification of number of important elements um, highlighted what the target group is of course the indigenous peoples, but uh, young people and young girls, uh, elders and women are those who in future uh, will uh, carry on, transmit uh, indigenous language to, to the next generation. Uh, so this is why uh, the activity three uh, invites to focus on more gender specific, age specific um, um, aspects, as well as support community based institutions, uh, which would be playing an important role in teaching and learning uh, of uh, languages. Uh, so that would be a very short introduction uh, to the key elements of the Global Action Plan. And of course, uh, just maybe a few words, what UNESCO is working on the development of a um, new tool, which would be online platform to collect data on world languages, which is called World Atlas of Languages, and the, in very short futures it would be launched and made available to all stakeholders. I'll stop here and thank you colleagues for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Imgarda, for this very interesting presentation. Um, the next speaker will be Dr. Diane Chambers, who is uh, Associate Professor at uh, Notre Dame University, and she will be speaking about accessibility. And the floor is yours, Diane. Thank you. Thank you. So is it OK if I share my screen? Uh, welcome, everybody, and thank you very much for <clears throat> the invitation to speak with you tonight for me and maybe this morning for you. So I'm going to speak tonight just very briefly about accessible and inclusive open education resources. Um, I've been doing some work recently uh, with the Commonwealth of Learning looking at inclusive open education resources in uh, countries that maybe have a poorer quality of um, accessibility to electronic resources. So looking more broadly, not just electronic resources, but actually making sure open education resources are available very broadly. So one of the questions I'm going to be addressing tonight is, is how open and distance learning, which includes open educational resources, can be a game changer for people with disabilities. Um, we know that open and distance learning can be blended, it can be flexible, uh, it could be in some cases, some countries are using print-based materials um, due to COVID. So it can be a variety of different types of learning. Uh, we know that open education resources are those that reside in the public domain. And <clears throat> they're open license, they permit no cost access. So you know, it can be very useful for people living in poverty, for example. They're able to be reused, they're able to be repurposed, adapted, and then redistributed. Now, obviously, copyright is always kept in these particular cases, but it's actually released under a particular um, license. And usually it's a, it's a um, Creative Commons license. So when we're looking at accessible or inclusive um, OER, there are resources which allow people with a disability to also act, access that content. And it's really interesting because a lot of the resources that are available um, quite a lot of it is not accessible for people who are using assistive technology or who are, have particular modalities that they need to use to access content. So we do know that there are some um, difficulties in that area for people with disability. The benefits of making sure that our open uh, educational resources are accessible means that we can access content either offline or online and depends on the nature of the, the country that you're residing in, um, whether or not there's an internet connection or even power for that day. Okay. Um, we, we can make them more cost effective and affordable. So people who may be um, living in poverty, uh, people with disability um, may not be able to afford particular technologies. So making sure that it's cost effective for them as well, but also cost effective for the countries that might be using it. Um, if you're going to a country that's a fairly low income country, then maybe having access to good quality um, open educational resources can make a significant difference to the educational outcomes for those people. We know that people with disabilities um, should be able to access learning where previously they're not. So where they might have been denied access to learning at all, um, inclusive OERs can actually open the door for them to access that learning. 
they're also then more likely to gain employment and be a part of the community. So those, those social and economic benefits are significant when we're making sure that all members of the community can, can access this type of information. And of course, one of the other benefits is to realise the potential of the UNESCO recommendation um, that Asiatu just uh, described for us. So being able to realise that recommendation is um, something that's really important. When we talk about benefits for uh, inclusive OER, we also need to acknowledge that there's a number of barriers to making open educational resources inclusive for all. One of these is the languages used in the creation of the resources. So thank you, Amgada, for your um, excellent presentation. That definitely is something that comes out in the literature as well. Um, particularly if you've got people who are learning English and then being taught in English, but also the readability level of, of the content. Uh, if I have a student, for example, with, a, uh, with dyslexia or a learning disability, then I can actually pre present the same sort of content at a different level of readability. And that would make a, a massive difference to that person's ability to actually uh, understand that content. Things like images, charts and figures, which are often um, instrumental to the text, you can't separate them from the text, uh, do often not include the alternative text which describes the figure or describes the chart. And that's really critical for people who have a vision impairment, for example. If they're using a screen reader, it needs to be able to access that alternative text uh, in order for them to make those connections between um, charts, figures and text that's already available. Uh, multimedia such as video uh, can sometimes not have uh, closed captions or tra uh, transcripts associated, um, which once again makes it difficult for people if they're not able to hear um, to access that particular content. There's also a lack of access to digital technology for learning. And this is something that I alluded to earlier. And I'm currently doing some work in Zambia and Gambia. And for a lot of the people there, just uh, accessing the internet is quite difficult. So we need to also consider how we make our open educational resources available in an offline capacity too. And we can't do that with everything, but there's quite a lot that we can do there as well. Sometimes there's poor assistive technology compatibility with the open education resources. Uh, if I've got a student, for example, who's using a DAISY reader or um, JAWS uh, uh, that's reading a screen, um, if it's the OER is not set up to actually enable that to be read by that particular device or, or software, then it can be very difficult for somebody to um, utilise it effectively. The other thing that comes out in the literature and is very much coming out in some of the research I'm doing at the moment is that locating appropriate accessible open education resources can be quite difficult. And it's, it's knowing what it means that an OER is accessible. So can somebody actually access that open education resource regardless of their um, disability, regardless if they have a vision impairment, a hearing impairment, um, maybe they can't read effectively, uh, maybe they have physical disability. So it, it's accessible if everybody that you could picture could actually access that particular resource. When we're designing inclusive open educational resources, it's really important that we, we design it from the start to be accessible. It's much more difficult to go back and retrofit existing um, OER and make it into an accessible resource. So if we actually just, dive in and design our, our open education resources from the start, we can make sure they're accessible from day dot and we don't have to go back and do extra work. It might then be able to be used by you know, a wide variety of people, including people with disabilities, those living in remote and rural areas um, and people living in poverty as well. So there's some accessibility principles which um, can be used when we're designing inclusive OER. And these, these come from web-based principles, but they do apply here as well. So making sure that the information we're providing or we're, content that we're providing um, in our resources is perceivable. So able to be accessed by you know, a wide variety of different modalities, that it can be navigated effectively and in a variety of different ways. So I, I have um, I've had students, for example, who would use a, um, a mouth operated switch. Uh, can they access that content that way? Um, all sorts of different ways that they can access. 
Could it be understandable? So simple language, explaining the background, explaining the graphics effectively. And is it robust? So the content really compatible with lots of different um, technology, but also compatible with possible future technology. So maybe having a, a bit of a, um, an idea about what might be coming up as well. The other thing that we can use when we're designing inclusive open educational resources is universal design for learning. And here is where we're thinking about how we present content, how the person presents their understanding, the action and expression, and how they're engaging with that particular content. So using some of the principles of universal design for learning is another really effective way um, to ensure that we're designing our open educational resources from the start where they have some accessibility um, available. So some example considerations when we're looking at open education resources, things we need to consider is how our content is organised. Is it logical? Um, is it clear? Is it uncluttered? So can that person perceive that content appropriately? Uh, I talked about images already, making sure that they're clear and understandable and that they've got alternative text so that the person can understand it. Uh, links and tables can be very, very difficult for some screen readers um, to access. So making sure that we can um, use those effectively is really important. There is some uh, good speech to text, um, uh, text to speech software that allow you to read out formulas. Um, so MathXL, for example, and things like font sizes, can you make them changeable? Can you make a person you know, select a particular font size in it? One of the biggest things with um, accessible OER is PDF documents. So a lot of PDF documents are actually not accessible. And if you go onto the um, Adobe website, they actually have a, a really great um, example of how you can make your PDF accessible. Okay. There's also that assistive technology compatibility. So you need to think about what types of assistive technologies your, your students, your cohort uh, might be using so that you can make sure that your OER is accessible for them. So you might need to get some expert opinions or some extra expert assistance with that if need be. There is some tools to assist you to determine whether or not you have um, some accessible content. So if you're using a learning management system, for example, like Moodle, they actually have a, an inbuilt accessibility checker. And when you've put your content in, you can click on the, the checker, it'll actually tell you whether or not your content is accessible. There's things like the web accessibility evaluation tools, the WAVE tool, and probably the most uh, commonly used is the web content accessibility guidelines. And as I said, the Adobe um, have, a, have a wizard that can help you making your PDFs accessible as well. So when we're putting up various content in these open education resources, we really need to be thinking about every component and making sure it can be accessed by a wide variety of people. Some of the recommendations for the development of Accessible OER, obviously policy development. Um, Malaysia's got an excellent example of this. They've actually now developed a national policy on inclusive open education resources um, with assistance from UNESCO and a variety of other, um, Hewlett Packard, a variety of other people. Uh, also dissemination of the Accessible OER guidelines for practitioners. So if we're working with uh, universities, if we're working with technical colleges, if we're working with schools, how do we make sure that people understand what an accessible OER is and what guidelines are there available for them? There's also a need for further research on the barriers, but also the enablers of accessible OER. Who does it well? And you know, what does it mean to have a really good accessible OER? And then something else that comes out of the research too is support in locating accessible OER. So there's a number of very large, um, repositories for open educational resources, OER Commons, for example, uh, but it doesn't necessarily tell you if it's an accessible OER. So you have to go in and do that work yourself sometimes. So maybe some further support in that area would be useful as well um, for practitioners. So in conclusion, the accessibility of OER in open and distance learning really allows others to more effectively reuse, remix, repurpose and adapt content for local use and can be a total game changer for people with disability and other disadvantaged groups. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Diane. Uh, that was really informative. Uh, thank you, thank you again. 
We will continue addressing the accessibility issue with uh, the next speaker, Dr. Darvishi, who is professor at uh, Zurich University of Applied Science, and he will uh, uh, talk about accessibility and the higher education perspective. Uh, Dr. Darvishi, uh, you can share your screen. The floor is yours. Maybe just a, a short correction. Uh, Zainab told uh, us that my affiliation is Zurich University of Applied Sciences, School of Engineering, Institute for Mechatronics, which is partially true. I'm working uh, mostly at uh, Institute for Ap uh, Applied uh, Information Systems Technology. Uh, so I know the topic of accessibility uh, almost for my whole life because I have a severe visual impairment since age of 15. And I studied computer science at university here and I use magnification software and also refreshable brain uh, to be able to uh, do my education and also did my PhD uh, in computer science, especially in the area of uh, accessibility. And a short introduction about my research, uh, two important uh, areas of my research are accessible education and accessible mobility, accessible education to make sure that the materials that we uh, research and develop tools who can make life of uh, students with disabilities easier. I will give you an example later in my presentation and also support students with uh, disabilities if they need kind of support for digital assistive technologies. And also I have another area, accessible mobility, which is mainly about uh, using computer vision-based solutions uh, to help visually impaired people to navigate around the urban environment, to identify obstacles and so on, as well as uh, another project is about uh, finding accessible walking route for people with mobility impairment uh, uh, that's another area. And we also offer uh, lectures for students in the area of web accessibility, PDF access, document accessibility, and also offer all engineering students a lecture about digital assistive technologies. And the students had, have the possibility to bring their ideas, to talk to people with disabilities and bring their ideas to develop, to uh, make concepts, uh, for new kind of uh, digital assistive technologies to overcome their barriers. I think I shouldn't talk much more about the recommendation, uh, UNESCO uni recommendation on uh, OER from 2019, but as we have heard until now, they, they should uh, ensure principle, for instance, of uh, equal education, accessibility, and uh, inclusion are reflected in the strategies and programs. And action program three especially is very important that encouraging accessible and equal uh, material for people with uh, impairment. So I would like to report about uh, uh, initiative in Switzerland, which is, uh, is called uh, Swiss Digital Academy. And especially the topic is about uh, open educational resources. There are more than uh, 10 universities, actually 13 universities are involved in this project. And the main topic of this project, that's a four year project is uh, open educational resources. And universities are involved, or technical university, or different kind of universities in Switzerland, including including my university, and especially my group. And these four years project have uh, four modules, five modules, and one of the modules is about uh, access for all. And that topic is about OER accessibility. I will tell you more about it on the next slide. And uh, we just make sure we coach 
other modules, other partners in this project that uh, OER they are designing and they are promoting also are accessible for uh, everybody. So here are some measures that we uh, plan or already carried out last year. We started last year. We had an introduction, uh, introductory workshop on uh, uh, digital accessibility. So uh, me and my uh, uh, team member, Orion, who is a PhD student also in this call, we created this workshop. We carried out this workshop for all other universities involved in this project. We gave them the basic fundamentals of digital accessibility. And also we had, uh, we offered them the opportunity, hands-on hands -on training, so they could, uh, with very small uh, uh, task, they could, for instance, uh, create captioning using uh, avail open available, free available software uh, to create caption for videos. So they had the opportunities to create audio description for, for instance, for uh, people with visual impairment. And they had the possibility to test the website. And also they had the possibility to uh, check accessibility of a document. So it was the first workshop. And we had another workshop for uh, uh, lecturers and researchers. Uh, we gave them an introductory workshop on OER accessibility. We introduced them eight basic areas of accessible OER. Um, and we have also other uh, activities which you see here, for instance, creating video materials, very short video materials about different aspects of OER accessibility. For instance, how you create accessible images, videos about how basic principle of document accessibility or uh, uh, tools which are needed for people with uh, other kind of disabilities. So we call them learning nuggets. Uh, so these videos are very short video. We are in the process of creating them and they should be available uh, so uh, that's more sustainable. So after the project, the people can just watch the videos and, and see what, what is important. And we also organize, we plan to organize workshop on accessible, uh, creating accessible documents, accessible PDF, and uh, accessible uh, PowerPoint words or captioning and this kind of, and also we uh, will test the, uh, platform, OER platforms, which are planned to be created within this project from other partners, so we can make sure that uh, if they design them, design this platform, these, these are accessible, so they don't have to do re-engineering, as already mentioned. And one important uh, uh, work or uh, measure that uh, my assistant, Orion, is doing now, uh, she's trying to carry out a set of interviews with, with people who are involved in training um, or creating uh, OER content. Uh, and this is ongoing. So if you know somebody who is involved in the creation of OER materials or training of OER material, we would be very happy to uh, um, have an interview with, with the person so we can uh, use them for our evaluation. And the result of these uh, interviews will be published in kind of uh, uh, conferences. And we also plan to create guidelines for our partners within this national project about OER. And of course, we would be happy also to uh, not to re-event re the bill, to use the other resources available, as Diane already mentioned, we would be happy to look at them and maybe redistribute them among our partners as well. One of the important topics that we have within our project or my team is creating accessible PDF. 
we uh, created a platform, a, a web a free available software called PAVE. PAVE stands for PDF Accessibility Evaluation Engine. So that's a, a service that everybody can use. You can upload your PDF document and this software analyzes your document in terms of accessibility and fix some issues which uh, are possible to fix them automatically. And some other issues are solved or resolved through interaction with the user. So the idea behind this project was because uh, if you want to make PDF accessible, there are tools such as Adobe Professional or other tools available, but you have to have some knowledge of accessibility. And our idea was to offer a tool which is easy to use that really you don't need so much knowledge to create uh, accessible PDF. So we have also, we offer some video tutorial also on this platform. So if you're using, you would like to use this uh, tool, you can watch these videos and then know quickly how to use this tool. And also, uh, it is, uh, is is free of charge, so it's available worldwide. And this tool is used very much worldwide, especially in North America. And I know from many, many, many countries, I've received everyday emails, uh, so asking about uh, <coughs> providing support to them. But it has some disadvantages. So that's why we, uh, uh, we, we um, create a new research project, we, uh, a research project which was, uh, which is funded by Swiss National Foundation is about four uh, years project. And the idea behind the new project is to use AI, artificial intelligence, to uh, make uh, creation, to the, the process of uh, creation of PDF document uh, efficient as possible. Because even with the current PAVE tool, you need a lot of time to create an accessible PDF. Because using AI uh, should support us to, to create uh, accessible PDF documents, especially scientific PDF documents, much more easier. So scientific documents have mathematical formulas, they have graphics. So for instance, uh, the main part of the project is how you can uh, make mathematical formula accessible efficiently. And also we create other kind of uh, additional tools. So the new version uh, of PAVE 2.0, hopefully uh, available in, in, uh, in uh, two or three years, will support much more so you can create PDF documents, especially scientific PDFs, much more easier. So that's all. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Darvishi. You are doing great work in your institution. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, speaker and uh, the last one will be uh, Ms. Mona Larucci, who is the director of the Institute for Education and Training for the Francophony. Uh, Madame Larucci, c'est à vous. Merci. So thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I should like to uh, wish uh, everybody who is connected a, a very a good education day. Uh, there are all those who work in the area and we're all aware that it is the basis of a changing and modern society. So I shall uh, be discussing inclusive and accessible targeted OER. We have gone over the very various ways of granting uh, accessibility. We've looked at user-friendly uh, system, etc. So I'll be looking at accessible OERs. So we are. We work in the field, we're in Africa, and uh, the Institute, in fact, uh, has its headquarters in Dakar. Uh, so uh, we want resources to be open uh, and accessible, and I mean accessible to all, I shall explain. So I shan't uh, repeat 
repeat what has been said, but we saw that uh, the guidelines allow to have uh, the uh, right OERs, and we also looked at all the recommendations. But in most countries, infrastructures don't really make it possible to access resources, and sometimes connections aren't stable enough uh, to access the resources. Now, if the infrastructures are there, they are not suited to specific projects. Videos were mentioned earlier because uh, uh, there isn't enough broadband. And uh, OERs are in English or French, Spanish, Chinese or Arabic, but uh, very seldom in local languages. And OERs call for a minimum uh, know-how in uh, using a computer, and that's not a given either. So what is our answer to that type of problem. First of all, we set up uh, gateways uh, for OERs, which are accessible uh, via uh, mobile devices, and uh, therefore we have allowed asynchronous access. Um, the resources can be downloaded and kept on the device and be accessed later on. We also have uh, uh, small servers, uh, so these small accessible uh, modules uh, allow access uh, to online and offline uh, OERs. Uh, they can be downloaded onto these little servers. Uh, these servers can, for instance, be made available to a classroom, and the teacher and students uh, can then access the contents offline as well as online. So it's access to educational resource, resources um, offline. So we have resources in French, English, Spanish, Chinese, and Arabic, but we're also working on resources in national languages. So we have a program, École et Langue Nationale, school and schools and national languages. For instance, in Senegal, there are five languages. And uh, uh, given the uh, football, uh, there's Cameroon with its many languages as well. So um, we have been able to set up transformation devices uh, between the uh, languages. And these are educational resources which are freely accessible for all teachers. And then there's a problem we've come up against and which has become uh, more stringent uh, post-COVID because um, there, you have to be at least slightly computer savvy to uh, access the contents. So, so we have uh, free resources uh, for uh, anybody who uh, wishes uh, to uh, become a slight uh, computer literate, very, very simple little resources. What is Google? What is Wikipedia, etc. So now I come back to my introduction to say that for us, an OER is accessible across the world and must take into account the diversity, capabilities, language, culture, gender, uh, age, etc., uh, to become a uh, true OER. Then I was talking about uh, index targeted resources that are easily accessible. Very often when you have portals, uh, the question uh, is that people are saying everything's on Google, why should I use your portal? Well, the answer is that ours is uh, specialized in gender equality, allowing inclusivity and uh, to allow girls to remain in the classroom as long as possible. And so very quickly, 
uh, I shall give you some figures. The number of girls in primary schools is uh, rising, but there are still far fewer than boys. Access to higher education has also taken a leap forward, but uh, there are still many more young men. And the first uh, victims of the COVID crisis are girls because uh, they have been made to stay at home. So we've set all this up in order to attract more women to classrooms, to have more women teachers. And well, this is not the subject, but let me say that uh, uh, the longer uh, women stay in the classroom, the higher the uh, income of the household, and, and it greatly enhances education. So, so do go to the website, francophonie.org, and uh, you will find the various campaigns. Uh, there are 260 resources. Uh, these are mainly teaching, uh, uh, teaching uh, uh, devices, how to organize the uh, uh, sports uh, session, uh, for instance, and uh, with no uh, sexism. Uh, and there is also a highly interactive video game for Android and iOS. It's going to be launched uh, on Wednesday, Wednesday the 26th, and uh, they are resources uh, telling you in which country, uh, which country saw the first woman train driver, for instance. So, so it is a specialized uh, portal. And that is the answer to the question, why not simply Google? Because here we have dedicated resources and you have a three level uh, browser. So you'll be able to find good practices, uh, uh, legal texts and a lot of other materials. So uh, there's a whole network of people behind this. Thank you very much. Thank you for your invitation. And of course, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you very much. Maybe you could uh, share the link you referred to in your presentation, because there was a bit of a problem with the slides, so we didn't see them. Yes, well, we can do it manually. Maybe you can see them this way. Well, if there are any links, maybe you could uh, share them in the chat. And Ilias Ahmed from the Djibouti University has a question. Could we have examples of quality OERs in French? Well, I take it, uh, uh, I'd approach it uh, differently, depends what quality entails. Uh, according to the uh, university, quality is contextualized. In South Sahara and Africa, it's an accessible resource, whatever the quality of uh, uh, the link, something you can download. And we mentioned PDFs earlier as well. So there are lots of resources which uh, fall in that category. So it's not so much about the quality of resources, but uh, rather how to share quality resources. Thank you very much. So the first one is, what measures and strategies UNESCO has planned to do to have equal access to learning to people that cannot understand oh, foreign languages? Okay, we have, uh, we're work, one of the priorities is to work with our stakeholder groups 
in developing multilingual versions of multilingual OER. So it's true for the moment, we have been focusing on the UN languages and specifically, um, and we are, there is a push now to, we have been working with governments and trying, speaking about the necessity to have the multilingual versions of OER. And I think this is an ongoing task and it's uh, one of these, one of these initiatives is in fact, webinars such as this in which we raise, uh, we raise um, awareness on this issue. And the second question was... Um, what stakeholder in each country UNESCO has thought to work with for easy implementations for planned activities? Well, that's... Uh, the issue is that the, the stakeholders in the, in, the, in the recommendation are uh, are clearly laid out in this in the def in the uh, in the definition section of the document, and I think my colleague I said you showed it on her on her presentation. In terms of UNESCO, our priorities are with, of course, it's the member states. We're an intergovernmental organization, but at the same time, uh, we all our activities we're focusing on all the stakeholders also, and including uh, civil society institutions and the civil society partners that we see in the list of uh, partners that are there in the rec in the definitions, and that's those are educational partners and. Uh, those working in institutions such as libraries and cultural institutions and the private sector. And I see those working on ICT structures. Um, I think that's the yes, issue. Questions. There are no more questions. Uh, if uh, anyone wants to take the floor. Okay, thank you very much to everybody. Thank you very much for, thank you to our speakers, to Dr. Darvashi, Dr. Chambers, Dr. Larusi, and Dr. Kassinskaite. And to, uh, and we thank you very much for your inputs. This has been a very interesting and very fruitful discussion. Uh, we will be, uh, we will be putting it on YouTube. Uh, it might take a little while and we will, uh, we invite you to, to keep, uh, keep uh, updated through the, uh, through the, the links that we're sending out on the, on the OER Dynamic Coalition. And we thank you again very much for everything, for coming and uh, wish you a very happy rest of January and happy International Day for Education also. And uh, we will send you an update on the next upcoming uh, uh, Dynamic Coalition webinar very shortly. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.